In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. I got to tell you, after that daily dose of stupid, I kind of feel like I just got done with the Chaplain's Report. I really did almost say, uh, stay the course, friends, at the end of that. <laughs> but we, we actually do have a Chaplain's Report today, and it is continuing our series in the book of 1 Samuel. Just to sort of reset the table, because I know that we had to stray away from that series last uh, week. So just to give you an idea of where we are in this story. Israel is already camped, and they are making ready the battle for the Philistines. So they're getting ready to go out and fight the Philistines, defend them off. They've had some success recently, but they've also had some failures. The Pharisees, uh, the, Pharisees the Philistines have been a thorn in their side this whole time, and so uh, the camp is gathered, Israel is gathered, they're getting ready to go. And that's really where this scene unfolds here in 1 Samuel, where Jonathan, the son of Saul, the king, so Prince Jonathan, sneaks away for a little bit, really without anybody except for his armor bearer noticing, and that's where we join the narrative right here in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 6 through 10. Then Jonathan said to the young man who was carrying his armor, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, talking about the Philistines there, of course, Perhaps the Lord will work for us, for the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. His armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart, turn yourself, and here I am with you according to you, according to your desire. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men and reveal ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has given them into our hands, and this shall be the sign to us. I'm a really, really big fan of the book of First and Second Samuel. It's part of the reason I decided to do this series in the first place is because there is so much good contained within these books of the Bible. But there's so much focus on Samuel and David and Saul that sometimes I think we forget some of the minor characters. And, and I don't even know if I consider Jonathan a minor character because he, he plays a pretty instrumental role in this story. But sometimes we ignore Jonathan. And when you read that passage of Scripture, you just kind of have to take a step back and go, man, Jonathan had some faith. Jonathan's not just a plot device. He's not just David's best friend that also happens to be the son of the king that wants to kill him, although that does create quite a bit of intrigue. Jonathan's a pretty interesting character in his own right, and verses like this really remind us of that that he's not just a plot device for the writer of 1 Samuel. He plays an integral role in the story, and he is a pretty interesting servant of God, really on his own. And this really depicts that, because you look at that level of faith. You look at the way that Jonathan looks at the situation, assesses it, and moves forward. you got to respect Jonathan for what he did there. Look back at it again there, especially in verse 6, where Jonathan is saying, look, we're going to go up and we're going to go right into the base camp of our enemies. And the reason that he gives, the rationale that he gives for why that is appropriate is he said, God's not restricted by saving us by many or a few. Whoa. What Jonathan is saying there is... Well, I mean, God certainly can save us. He certainly can, you know, bring forth a massive army and, and take out the Philistines. Or he could just save us by diplomacy. He could save us by just me and you going up there and negotiating something. So in other words, he's saying, I have faith in God's power. God can do whatever he wants. God has the ultimate authority here. He is already, and he says this later down in, in that same passage, God has already delivered them into our hands. And so maybe he's going to do it through our armies, but 
There's also a chance that he could do it through me, through diplomacy and just going up and talking to them. So I will make myself the instrument here. I will put myself in the right place at the right time to be used by God as he sees fit. That's somebody that's really dedicated to the Lord. And I want you to keep this in mind too. Jonathan's not just some random representative. He's not some random advisor to the king or a governor or something. He's the prince. He is King Saul's son, which means he would be a very, very appetizing target for the Philistine army. If he's walking into their garrison, all they would have to do is capture him and then use him as leverage against Saul. And Jonathan's not an idiot. He knows that. But he has such confidence that God is going to deliver Israel that he says, I want to put my place in the right place at the right, I want to put myself in the right place at the right time to be used by God as he sees fit, and we're going to go ahead and do this. And his armor bearer is so impressed by this, he's like, all right, well, do whatever you want, and uh, I will follow you. So his armor bearer had quite a bit of faith in Jonathan and in God as well. But you have to also remember that that's even more courageous and even more amazing when you consider the scenario. Because not only is he the prince of the enemy to these Philistines, but they were Philistines. It's not like he's fighting a war like the the British and the Americans where both sides are civilized and they might negotiate a, a soldier return or something like that. There was no Geneva Convention to protect Jonathan from being tortured or killed or worse. I mean, keep in mind that we read just chapters earlier in 1 Samuel about the Philistines, this same group of people taking people and decapitating them and displaying their heads as trophies. I mean, all kinds of horrible things. And Jonathan knows all this. And he is so incredibly fearless because he has complete and utter confidence that God is going to deliver him that he does this anyway. That's an incredibly impressive young man. And frankly, it's easy to see why he and David got along so well, because they thought the same way. They had the same priorities, and they had a very similar faith in God. Because doesn't this sound like something David would do? Because I got to tell you, to me, this sounds almost like they they switched the names here and accidentally said Jonathan instead of David. This is a very David-esque thing to do. And so it's, it's not hard to see why they became such good friends, because He is choosing to walk into the belly of the beast as Israel's representative and walks with no fear. That's an impressive thing to do and something that I hope to emulate in my own life. That when he says the Lord has already delivered our enemies into our hands, we don't have to worry about it. We will be fine and I'm going to make sure that I'm in the right place to do what God wants me to do. That's something that we should want every single day of our lives. That's something that we should try to implement. We should walk through life going, you know what? I need to be in the right place to do what God wants me to do. I need to put myself in positions to where God can use me. And now, I won't spoil it because we'll be going over that tomorrow, but that's exactly what God did. God used Jonathan in his courage and his fearlessness. He used Jonathan in a way to bring about the change that his father, I don't know, maybe could have. Maybe they would have won the battle. But God's power was so absolute, and God, because he he involves himself in the lives of men through providence, he uses Jonathan as his tool to do the right thing because of his faithfulness, because of his courage. And the thing is, we should all be just as willing as Jonathan to be instruments in in God's plan as as well. And sometimes that takes different forms. Sometimes it's just putting ourselves in the way of somebody so that we can teach them the gospel. Sometimes it's putting ourselves out there and actually preaching to to the public. Uh, Sometimes it's with other Christians. Sometimes it's with a friend that we know is, is having some trouble or struggling with something and putting ourselves in a position to where we're available to be used as God's instrument to keep them on the right path. So there's millions and millions of different possibilities and ways that we can do this. But the point is, Jonathan made a conscious effort to do so. He believed that the battle was already decided, the battle was already won, that God was going to win anyway. Just let me be used as a tool in God's ultimate plan on that. 
That's something that we should be striving for as well. So as we go throughout this week, as we're starting here, let us make it a point to put ourselves in positions to be used by God as an instrument of His will, just like Jonathan did. And sometimes it's going to take some real courage. Sometimes it's going to put us in positions that we will not be comfortable in, just like Jonathan was doing here. But ultimately, it's worth it. And ultimately, that kind of faith is going to lead us to be a person like Jonathan was. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them, I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter, and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.